focus today is going to be in Matthew chapter 10, and so you can turn there. We're going to go through some other scriptures as well, but be prepared there in Matthew chapter 10. Um, before we go there, today's topic in, in Matthew chapter 10 is about confessing Christ before men to make him known. And so I want to do first is introduce exactly what does that mean to confess Christ before men. If you look at the Greek word for this, and I'm astounding with Greek. I took one semester about 20 years ago, so I have this down. Um, the Greek homo logeso says to say the same thing or to agree with. And so when you confess someone or you confess something before Christ, before men, you're basically agreeing with that, what that person says or you're agreeing with what they do. The same thing. And so a number of scriptures we have that introduce this idea of confessing uh, Christ before men. Matthew chapter 10, 32 says this, and you don't need to go to each one of these. I'll, I'll just give you a few different verses here today. But Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 says, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. And that's similar to the verse in Luke chapter 12, 8, has the same concept, confessing him before men. Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 29, and Jesus is talking with the disciples about who the people say that he is. And the disciples said, well, say, some say that you're John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, or one of the other prophets and Jesus asked Peter, the one who's always willing to say something, he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, you are the Christ. And so in Acts 26, we also get another introduction of this, what it means to confess men. We see Paul confess before King Agrippa, telling of his story of conversion from the zealot persecutor of Christians, one who went about trying to get rid of all of these lousy Christians to a Christian himself, a believer on his own part. And so he's confessing to Agrippa that he agrees with what the scriptures say in terms of the prophecies of scripture calling out what has happened to be Christ Jesus himself as the Messiah. Now one scripture I picked up in this is it's always good to look at the flip side of this and what does it mean on the other side, and not confessing him. In John, trap, in John chapter 12, verse 42, it says that the rulers at that time did not want to confess Jesus out of fear. It says, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Why? Lest they should be put out of the synagogue for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So even though they believed, they kept it within themselves. They had that faith, they understood who this was, but they did not want to express it outside of themselves because they feared. Today we're gonna to look at some verses in chapter 10 and going to some insights from this significant event that really occurs in the lives of the disciples of Jesus at this time. For some time now, the disciples had followed Jesus throughout his ministry and during the time they'd observed, think of this from last week when Brother Aaron brought this, they had observed the work of Jesus and they'd listened to the words that he gave as he traveled along with them together and he sat down with them, broke bread with them, did all the things of life together with him, they observed and they listened to all of these things that he was saying. These disciples had seen sick people healed of all kinds of horrible diseases. 
They watched as he restored the sight of the blind and put words back into the mouth of the mute. They sat on a hillside, listening to him expound words they'd never heard before about the mercies of God and man's problem of the heart, the Sermon on the Mount as we know it. And words like, you've heard it said, You'll sh you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. And again, another verse, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And he continued to fill these men with all of these blessings after blessing, words of life that fed them in their souls, doing these great deeds that astounded everyone around them. Even the skeptics were astounded by what he could do. And everything he did, everything he said, was done for a purpose. Not one thing was done without purpose that he did. Every little thing he did along the way in his ministry had purpose. And he continues to do that. One of the purposes was to prepare these men for what would come next. He was preparing them to confess them before men and to make him known. So let's do this. Let's back up a few verses before chapter 10. I want you to take a look at this with me. In verse 35, um, verse 35, this kind of gets a run at it here, so I want to take this from verse 35 and down through verse um, 20 of chapter 10. So follow along as I read this. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary, they were scattered or helpless, like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to the disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And when, in verse 1, it says, And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease. And now the names of the 12 disciples are these. First, Simon, called Peter. Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee. And John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Labius, the surname was Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanite, and last of all, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And these 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, don't go into the way of the Gentiles, don't enter a city of the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, and freely you have been given, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts nor bag for your journey nor two tunics nor sandals nor staffs for a worker is worthy of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter in, inquire who is worthy and stay there till you go out. Then when you go into a house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. As surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But 
when, you del- when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. Father, I thank you, God, for this scripture. God, that you've provided for our instruction. Lord, that you can help us to glean what you need us to do today. Help me, help us all to get a glimpse of what you want us to do and to be obedient to that. Father, thank you, Lord, for the obedience of the disciples, and thank you most of all for, this, for the obedience of Jesus Christ. God, that he was willing to do what he did for us. And God, teach us today in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. When we make Christ known, when we make him known, we step out first in faith. And so there's an outline on your sheet you have today here, and I want you to just follow along with this as you go. When we make him known, we step out in faith. That's the first thing. We step out in faith, first of all, in our growth. Paul spent much of the time during his ministry travels and his letters exhorting us to grow, and he, and he taught them. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, we urge you, that you should abound more and more. And and this is the will of God, your sanctification. And and don't remain children, but continue to grow. Grow in the fruit and the bounty of the Lord. Continue to to feed and, and, and mature in Christ. Don't stay babies. Begin to eat that meat that God has given to you. Paul is adamant that we continue to grow as Christians, and we never stop growing, do we? That's something we do until we the day that God calls us home. In Matthew chapter 10, 1, Jesus calls the men that he has invested a lot of time in. He's taught them and helped them to grow, just like that. And the next thing he wants them to do is very significant. This church has done the same thing. We've continued to grow spiritually. And we've talked about this, that we have all kinds of opportunities here that God's afforded us to, to learn the scriptures, to, to, to dive deeper into his word and to understand what God wants us in our lives. And Pastor Josh has stood here many Sundays after Sundays and preached God's word. We've learned, we've grown, we've come accustomed to that. And thank the Lord that God has given us that. We have Sunday school classes for our kids downstairs. We have them in the evening for Awana. We have uh, our youth groups that get together Wednesday nights. I tell you, we have opportunity after opportunity to grow in Christ, and, and we've done well at that. And guess what? It's time to grow. It's time to step out in faith, just like the disciples, to stand on that solid foundation that's being built here by God. It's a, it's a natural thing for us to do. It's the next thing. It's a necessary thing for us to start growing as believers and stepping out in faith in our growth. Number two, when we make him known, we step out in faith in our own God. Our God we depend on. Notice who it is in these verses that's calling these men to go. Jesus. The one whom the angels proclaimed at his birth to be the savior of the world. It's the same savior who calls us to his work. The same one. As Aaron mentioned last week, he is both the teacher and the curriculum. I like that one. That's good. When we grow in Christ. He's both a teacher and curriculum. Well, we also get the call from him to tell others about him. We get the call from him to tell others about him. And do you know what kind of God that we get to tell others about? I, I think you do, but let me give you a few things here. First of all, no one, it's not, it's not that he is demanding obedience out of some selfish complex. That's not him. 
He's not one who sits on his throne and cares little about his people. That's not him. He's not one to hide his will and make us try to figure it out for ourselves. How to please him. There are a lot of faiths like that. You try to figure it out and you attain something. As Pastor Josh has mentioned many times, we cannot do anything of ourselves. It's not something we have to figure out. God's already given it to us in his word. He's already paid the price. And so God is someone who doesn't make us figure it out. Look at Psalm 103 for just a minute. Turn there with me if you will. This is a, this is a great uh, scripture to look at what kind of God we serve. Psalm 103, verse one, and I'm gonna read down through 14. Psalm 103, and I had Psalm 100 in here, and I didn't know that we were going to have that read to us today, and I took it off, and I told Josh, I said, well, that's great, because I took it off, and you read it, and I guess God wanted it to be there anyway. So I appreciate that God makes his will done. (laughs) Um, Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Hmm, that's the God we have. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses his acts to the children of Israel, and the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed your transgressions from us. And as the father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. That's the God we serve. That's the God we get to confess. John chapter one, verses one through five, and you know these words. It speaks of Jesus Christ himself. And let's turn there. I I was just going to leave it there, but let's turn over to John chapter one, verse one through five. These are scriptures that tell of Jesus Christ, the one who is sending us out. In the beginning was the word, that is Jesus. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That is Jesus, the one we serve, and the one we get to proclaim. That's the one we have our faith in. That's the God I get to confess. I could stay there on that one forever. That's a good one. But let's move on. Verse, or number three. When we make him known, we step out on faith in our purpose. Looking at chapter 10, verses seven through eight of Matthew again. The disciples were to cast out unclean spirits. And it says here in verses seven through eight, as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons and freely you have received, freely give. Um, The disciples were to do these things and to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As if this moment, at this time, Jesus had not suffered yet the cross. 
And God had told them to go out and do these things. There was one before these that had stood in and proclaimed some things. That was John the Baptist. God first sent John the Baptist to prepare prepare the way for Jesus, preaching repentance, proclaiming the one to come. And now in Matthew uh, 11.10, if you look there, Matthew chapter 11, verse 10, it says that for this he is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you from Malachi chapter three. He was to tell others to repent and that Jesus is coming. He's coming. Prepare yourselves. Jesus is coming. Now these disciples were to proclaim that Jesus is here. The kingdom is here. And not only that, but they were to serve others to show the goodness of God by healing and serving wherever they could. This was the purpose that Jesus called them to, to do good works and to glorify God. He sent them out to do those things. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared that we should walk in them, the same thing. Our purpose. The Westminster Confession of Faith is one that came to my mind. It says, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And along the way, we get to proclaim and serve God. This is our purpose. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 7 says this. For we do not preach ourselves, and this is Paul speaking, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. All of the glory, our purpose, should be of God and not of us. Everything I say here should be to God's glory and not of me. Everything you do should be to God's glory and not of you. And we accomplish this when we step out in faith and accomplish the purpose that God has called us to do. Isn't it glorious if you come to the end of your days to know that you've accomplished what God called you to do? That you have purpose beyond this life. When John mentioned this a little while ago, you know what he's talking about, that there are a lot of people without purpose in this life. They're going about their life trying to find purpose, stumbling around, trying to find something that gives them purpose in life. And you've seen the people that have no purpose, no direction in their life, and they're dark. God's called us to this. It's our purpose to glorify him. So when we do this and we make him known, we're accomplishing exactly what God called us to do. We're accomplishing it as a church family when we do this together as a church. We do it individually. We do it as a family. We accomplish what God calls us to do, to make him known. (laughs) All right, the next one. When we make him known, we reveal him. The Bible itself is a revelation of God. It speaks of him in so many different ways, tells stories of him throughout his interaction with mankind. We reveal him first in his character. In Matthew chapter 10, verse eight, notice this, what it says. It says that freely you have received, now freely give. Because this is God's character. He says, I'm very open. 
I'm selfless. I am full of grace. Now you be the same. When you go to the people, don't require them to do things or pay for their services. I invited you to follow me. I took you in, I taught you, I forgave all of your blunders and your sins, and I required nothing of you but to follow me. That's all I required of you. Now you do the same. When you go out, don't put burdens on the people. Tell them to follow. Tell them of what I've done. Now notice also in verses six and eight, who did he send these disciples to? Not to the wealthy of the land, not to the rulers of the land, not to the ones who had all of their lives in order, not to the one who had solid families of a middle income, who had the nice cars and great futures for their kids in college, but he sent them to the lost, the sick and even the dead. I'm afraid that I tend to get in a way that I forget the compassionate character of Christ. And I don't mirror that. You know what I'm saying? I, I forget that. I tend to look at the wrong places. You know, we're all lost. We're all sick. We're all dead without him. And he has a heart for the sick, the weak, the weary. And we confess him when we go to those same people with the same servant's attitude and reveal the love of Christ. We reveal him. We go to them and we show his character. Number two, we reveal him through his work. In Matthew chapter 10, verse eight, it says that Jesus gave the disciples the ability to heal and cast out the demons. And as they went and did this in the name of Jesus, they gave credit to Jesus. This is the one who gave us this power. We see over and over in scripture where Jesus says that he can only do the things that the Father has given him to do and the things that he has given them to say. And then his works are those that he was given to glorify the Father in heaven. The Jewish leaders were constantly baffled by the works and the words that they observed from Jesus. In, in John chapter seven, verse 15, it says this. They marveled, saying, how does this man know the letters? How can he know all these things when he's not been in study? How he's, he's, he's just a fisherman from the land of Galilee. How can he know all these things? And they were astounded by this. And Jesus answered them and said this. My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. In other words, the authority that Jesus has is not his own. And likewise, the authority that you and I have when we speak the word of God is not our own. The authority is given to us. It's imparted to us by God. And when we do our work and we point the way to God by the works that we do, we're actually showing God's character. We reveal more of God. So think of it this way. The things that you do and you serve, uh, whatever that is, in some way, even in this church, should reveal something about God and his work. This is what God is doing through me. This is not something that I just came up with. This is what God gave me to do. And I, by the way, have these abilities to even stand here and speak because God gave me the abilities. This is not me standing here speaking because I'm so good at it. This is because God gave me the abilities and I should announce that and I should confess that. Otherwise, I steal his glory. We're prone to stealing God's glory. We, we do that. I, I do that. Give ourselves the credit. Um, but when we find ways to gracefully turn the credit back to God, revealing God in the work that we do, we're making him known. Let's turn it back to him. 
As John the Baptist said of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. So look for these opportunities. And I'm going to pause here for a second and give a couple of applications. When you're healed of some sickness, think of it this way, and the doctors helped you through this, you can say to that doctor, say, I'm so glad, doctor, that God gave you the abilities to heal. And I'm praying for you. That's it. Guess what? You've just revealed something of God. Or when you are thanked for serving someone else when you've done it unselfishly and you weren't looking for glory, you can say, you're welcome. I'm just glad God gave me the time and the abilities. And I've been praying for something like that to be able to help. And look, God made it happen. You did two things there. You gave God the glory and you pointed them to prayer as being effective. And you did not get in their face. You didn't say something that they might find uh, oppressive or a problem. You just gave God the glory for that. We give God the credit. We acknowledge him. It's his work and not yours. Number three. We reveal him through his gospel. When Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 7, it says, um, to go and preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What, what did he mean by that? Well, there, there are books on this topic, and, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on that, so I'm going to shorten it all down by saying this, okay? The Jews had been looking waiting for someone to come, rescue them for a long, long time. Their prophets had pointed to one coming that would set up his kingdom, one that would never end and it would bring justice and healing to their land, something they would all look forward to. And I could do the same right now. I'm looking forward to the day when God will come back and take us out of this mess. But the Jews were misinterpreting this as a worldly conquering king. They, they misread it. Instead, they got somebody completely different. This was Jesus, born as a babe in a manger, a weak servant. That was not what they expected, was it? And these disciples were proclaiming the good news that the kingdom had finally arrived. Here he is. This is the one we've been looking for. Disappointing to some. They missed it. And after Jesus completed his work on the cross, the disciples were now able to proclaim the good news that we're forgiven when we believe on him and what he's accomplished for us. The message we get to proclaim is the same one. Every action, every word, every prayer should reveal something of the good news that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, which is me, which is you. That's why Jesus came. It's exciting to know that we have the answer. We have the answer for those who are lost and have no answer. They're finding they cannot do it on them, their own. We have such great news. There is no other answer to this world's problems except Jesus. And people will look for it, they will look for it, and they will look for it, and they will try, and they will try, and they try, and they will never get there if they do not look to Jesus. And we have the good news. So through his gospel, we are revealing what God is like. We reveal him and his character. We reveal everything about him, and we make him known. Now, <clears throat> some of you are going to say, well, that's a difficult thing to do. I understand that. Revealing his gospel and we talk all kinds of ways about how do we explain the gospel to people. And you just have to come back because we're going to keep talking about the gospel from here to the end of eternity, aren't we? This is something we'll continue to do. But we reveal the gospel. This is how we make him known. All right, number three. 
When we make him known, we complete his mission. In this mission, he commands. He commands. Yes, we're commanded at the end of the book of Matthew to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And, but look at it this way. He commands us to do this, but we get to go. It's an honor. And we get to send. We get to send people out. and We get to support them. We get to support missionaries. We get to support everyone who has done that and made that sacrifice. We get to send. We get to go. We get to tell. It's an honor. We get to reveal the one who saved us and who can do the same for them. Just like the disciples moved out to do something Jesus told them to do, we've been called to live our lives in such a way that we listen and we obey. And that thought made me think of this old hymn that we don't seem very, very much anymore, but called Trust and Obey. That's a good song. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. This is about where I'd want Holly to come up and play the piano that we don't have here right now and just sing the song together with us. Um, but we're going to do that one of these days when we walk with the Lord and we obey him. We trust and obey the Lord. We have the most caring and faithful commander we could ever ask for. The one who commands us to do these things is the most loving and most caring and the most merciful commander you could ever have. He said, if you love me, now keep my commandments in John chapter 14. So the question I have is, do we love him? Can you say that? The faithful one who gave his own life to redeem us. And he's calling us to love him enough to go and tell others about his wonderful grace, to trust him and believe in him. That's our commander. Number two, in this mission, he provides. He provides. These disciples, they were told to go out and take nothing with them. But they did have some things. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 18, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to read this again. Matthew 10, 18 says this, And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of their Father who speaks in you. He provides His Spirit for us. And Jesus makes it clear you know, we're not always going to enjoy this whole making him known thing. It's, it's not just like it's roses all the time. In some ways, we're going to find it extremely discouraging because we feel inadequate and downright scared to do that. Does anybody feel that way to tell others about Jesus? I'm not asking you to raise hands here. You know, if you do, that's okay. But I think all of us do that way. And over the years, I've learned something that... I can never learn enough to be truly prepared for everything that comes along. In fact, I understand now what others meant when they said, the older you get, the less you know. It is that way. It seems like I just don't know anything anymore. I learn, but yet there's just so much more. I think I'm just understanding that I just don't know enough. And I'm so unprepared for it when people come to talk to me. And I truly believe what I'm going to say next, that if you'll humble yourself, just admit that you're unprepared. Just admit it. And you're helpless because you are. 
And ask God to give you that strength, the words. He will do it. I truly believe that because I've seen it happen. And the more I've done that, the better I've found that God has worked through me because he gets the glory and not me. He provides the words. He does. In fact, if you remember the last time I spoke, well, maybe two times ago, I guess it was during the time when we had two people up here, I forgot my notes. I did not forget my notes today. I made sure those notes were right on top, and I, I checked them three times to make sure they were on top of my Bible and not left at home. But that will tell you who, where your glory comes from. When you forget your notes and you have to rely on God to put those things into your mouth and expound them. Uh, it was very humbling, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you, Lord. But don't do it again. I just don't want to. <laughs> um, he provides. Now, here's two things I'll give you on this. Two secrets to this, all right? You ready? If you want to make a note on this. This is very, very important. When you're going to talk to someone about Christ in whatever circumstance, what helps me most is I listen more. I listen. We're so quick to start talking and think that we have the answers, aren't we? The listening is so critical to two things. One is the other person you're talking to, and the other is God. You listen. The Holy Spirit is the one who gave these men the words to speak. God gave them the Holy Spirit, and he gives you the Holy Spirit as well. And he will provide those words. And by the way, if you don't know what to say, maybe you're not supposed to say anything at all. And you're supposed to listen more. And that's okay. When I've walked away and I say, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that. Well, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. And that's okay. And so keep that in mind as you're talking to people. Listen. Listen to them more. I, I talked to a gentleman here recently that he was all wanting to tell me everything uh, about himself and his faith. And I just let him talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And he finally stopped. And I said, so what do you know about me? He, he was kind of flummoxed by that. And I said, well, you haven't asked me any questions. You don't even know what I believe. You come and ask me these things and you don't know anything about me. You don't know why I believe what I believe. And then he started talking, 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 talking. So he didn't quite get it. But the idea is that we don't take time to just find out what people think. Listen. And listen to God. And God will give you the words to say. The second thing of that is keep your focus on the gospel of Christ. Boy, you can get so sidetracked if you don't. And what he's done and revealing him. So those are the two secrets. Not very secret, but they are good. Okay, number three. In this mission, he accomplishes. He accomplishes. The disciples were warned that they were going to face hate and scorn as they went out. And we just read this. You're going to be brought before governors and kings, and you're going to be delivered up to them. You're going to see days where your faith is not just laughed off and dismissed. And I've had that. If you've talked to people about Christ, I, you probably have too. It's just kind of one of those things. But you're going to get directly challenged. And your words are going to get used against you. Do you think that's going to be happening soon? I do. I, I see it coming. I'm not, I'm not welcoming it, but I do see it coming. You're going to get a little bit more deep derision for what you believe in. You believe that? Now, I had that brought to me early on in my Christian faith, and I was a little flummoxed to what to say, but you will get that more and more. And I just want to be honest with you, and, and Scripture's honest, and Jesus sent them out, and he was honest with them. He says, you are going to see this happen. It's not going to be easy. 
And when you see this happening, don't stop and don't give up, okay? Keep praying, looking for those opportunities, and keep encouraging each other. And rely on God to continue to work in the hearts of people. Don't give up on people. We cannot give up on people. This is the call that God's given to us. And don't, don't, don't give up. You say, well, I've talked to this person three times. They just don't seem to be there. They don't want to hear it. Don't give up. Continue to pray for them. If they're in your family, that's difficult. You're together, you see them, and you want things to be different, don't give up. Continue to pray. It can be years. Don't give up, okay? One of the hardest-hearted people ever to live, the Pharisee Saul, had heard the gospel of Christ spoken by others. He heard it. He'd undoubtedly witnessed or heard the miracles his disciples had performed, but even the resurrection and the unexplainable events that occurred failed to move this man of God, Saul. And then God moved him. God changed his heart. Now, he came down in a light that blinded him and those that were with him, and that may not be the circumstance for every person, but God moved him. That was God. And undoubtedly, each one of you were resistant to the gospel as well until God moved your heart. And somebody along the way had impact on you to tell you pieces of that gospel in some way or other, and everything lined up in God's time to bring you to that moment when God moved your heart and God brought you to himself. That's what happened with the Apostle Paul. When we do these things, don't think the words that you say and the actions you do to point them to Jesus are insignificant or that somehow you failed to do what you're supposed to do. When we step out in faith and we do this and we reveal the character of God and everything in our faith, we reveal him, we complete the mission that God gave us to do. We're doing everything God called us to do. And he will accomplish what he wants to happen. He will accomplish it. It's his work, not ours, and he does not fail. God is faithful. He will never fail. So where is your faith? Are you ready to step out in that faith? Are you ready to take what God's given to you and reveal it to others? If you've been doing this, praise the Lord, continue. Don't stop. Because people need the answer that we have. We have the answer to their heart problem, to their future. Continue. If you've found that you don't have that much faith and you struggle with that, you start by praying, God, give me the faith to reveal you to those around me. God, give me a burden for people. I don't feel that. That's not where I'm at. But I know I'm supposed to have it. God, give me that, that burden. And if you've never found faith in Christ, truly found faith in Jesus Christ and put your life into his hands to yoke with him for your life. This could be the day that you do that, to find faith in him. So let's start. Let's do this, okay? I'm gonna be encouraging you any way that I can encourage you. If you have someone that you know in your family or friend, someone you wanna to talk to about Christ, please, Feel free to come to me or Pastor Josh. Let's talk. 
Let's find a way. We don't have much time, people. This world, our lives are short. And people matter to God. So let's do this. Let's pray.